and welcome back to a fresh episode of the Business Growth Show. I'm your host, Sam Dunning, co-owner over at webvoiceuk.com. If you haven't yet, check out our weekly email where we share actual tips, podcasts, bonus resources, and much, much more every Monday to start your week off with a bang. You can sign up over at businessgrowth.email. Joining me today is returning guest, and without inflating his ego too much, he's probably one of the most viewed and downloaded episodes that we've had since he's been on. Um, recently, we've had him on sharing best practices for demos, working inbound leads. But it is Benjamin Dennehy, the UK's most hated sales trainer. Benjamin, welcome back, sir. How you doing? <laughs> Hello, Sam. Thanks for getting me back. Now, I only discovered yesterday why I'm the most downloaded. It turns out that the Kiwi accent is the sexiest accent in the world. Um, oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> even I struggle to believe that one. But uh, hey, that could explain why it was so popular. There we go. You and you didn't write that article, did you? No, no. It, <laughs> funnily enough, it wasn't my PR team that did it. <laughs> there we go, mate. There we go. Good stuff. So today we're going to be sharing a call to close. So from initial call right through to to closing and winning a deal, a sales masterclass. We're going to go through some best practices, actionable tips across each stage, right from initial calls through to winning or not winning or losing deals so let's jump straight into it sir okay i want to um i want to start from the very start so from initial cold call mm. what is the um what's the reason for it what are we trying to achieve what are we trying to get out of a cold call to, ah to so that's a good question see i ask everybody that question what is the purpose of a cold call and you get an array of answers and you mm. get things like well to get an appointment to find pain, uh, to understand need, uh, to gather information. You get all these answers like this, and nobody ever gets the real answer. And I say, look, those are all good answers, but everything you've just given me is an outcome. Right. Gathering information is an outcome. Finding pain is an outcome. Getting an appointment is an outcome. Outcomes are different from purpose. If you were to ask a lawyer what's the purpose of a trial, they wouldn't say to get an acquittal. To get a conviction. No, no, no. Those are outcomes. What's the purpose of trial? Then they'd give you the fancy, well, they're all about the administration of justice and the impartial hearing. Da, 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 da. So that's the right. purpose. But it's got multiple outcomes. So what is the purpose of prospecting? The purpose of prospecting is to get a human being emotional about whatever it is that you fix. Okay. So I'm phoning up a stranger. He's sitting at his desk, happy as Larry, eating a sandwich, egg and crass. Not a, not a care in the world at this moment in time. And then I phone up and I just talk about the three biggest things that I typically help my clients fix. And he either says, nah, I don't recognize any of those. Or he says, no, no, I, I can relate to some of those. And then in the space of about six to seven questions, I move him from intellectually acknowledging it to feeling it slightly. I'm not talking blood and guts on the table or the man breaking down an emotional cripple, right? I'm talking where he gets to the point where he says, you know what? It does kind of piss me off or it does frustrate me or it does annoy me. And yeah. then he says, all right, maybe we should continue the conversation. That is it. A good prospecting call lasts anywhere from six to eight minutes. Anything longer than that and you've moved into the realm of trying to sell them or you're waffling. And the Got problem it. with most salespeople on a prospecting call is they do the crab walk. They tend to go sideways. They're not pushing a person from intellect to emotion. And you can have great sideways conversation. You can talk to somebody for 20 minutes intellectually and get to the end of it. And they say, well, look, I've enjoyed the chat, but I don't feel there's anything here. It's because they've done nothing to move the person from intellect to emotion. So the purpose of a prospecting call is to get someone emotional about whatever it is that you fix. And you can't get everyone emotional because some people won't have them. They won't recognize them. They won't relate to them. They don't care about them. So it's not, uh, and that's the other thing. Prospecting calls aren't about getting everybody to say yep. yes. They're about finding the right people to say yes, because I don't want to be kissing frogs. I want to be kissing princesses. So I've got to find the princesses amongst the frogs. They're there, but there's only a few of them. Yeah. Well, that's, 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 perfect. that's what we're trying to do on a prospecting call. Nicely done. So in terms of um, moving people from intellect to emotion, why is it so important, Ben, to get people emotional? What's, because what's we buy emotionally and we justify intellectually. 
So it doesn't matter how intellectually brilliant my solution is. If I don't feel, if the prospect doesn't feel they need it, then why would they do it? So for instance, I, I, I've got, um, like everyone, I have a, a mobile phone or a cell phone if you're watching in America or the colonies. Yeah. So you've got a cell phone or you've got a mobile phone. And right now, there's no issues with it. It pretty much seems to get signal wherever I go. Phone calls work. Um, I'm paying a rate per month, which I'm quite happy with. I'm not that bothered by it. You know, it's a business expense. So if somebody phoned me up and tried to convince me intellectually, I tell you what, though, we can double your data. We can give you extra roaming. We can cut your bill by 15 quid a month. I'd say it's all well and good, but I... I, I I, I can't be asked going through the hassle of doing all of that because, th- th- like I say, my phone works out. But we could save you money. Yeah, but it's not the money, mate. I don't want to go through the whole fucking hassle of changing this and the new sim. Nah, uh, it's fine. So you're never going to get me. But you will get me, and this is this truly did happen to me. One day I was prospecting, yep. and my phone cut out twice on prospecting calls. Now, you never get back to somebody when you get cut off. Yeah. I was pissed off. That afternoon, some chancer phoned up selling telecom services, right? And because I was pissed off about what had happened in the morning, and he said to me, you know, and he started doing his thing, and I said, all right, I'll hear you out. Keep going. And he said, we'll give you this, we'll give you that, da, da, da. And I just said, all right, but I'll tell you what I said, I'm in. Let's do it. And you could hear the excitement in his voice. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. It's probably believe it, right? He was thrilled. I can't believe it. This guy's going to buy it. <laughs> and I said, hey, look, before we go forward, so can I ask you a question? He goes, yeah. I said, why am I buying from you? Why have I agreed to do this, do you know? And he goes, well, because, you know, we're going to double your data. Um, we're going to save you. I said, no, no, no. I said, look, I have no idea if the service you're about to give me is going to be any better. I don't need the extra data. I'm going to take it because you've offered it. I, I don't even, do you know why I'm buying this? He goes, well, I said, spite. <laughs> I said, because as of today, Anger. whoever it was that was getting my monthly fee, they ain't getting my money. You could be equally as crap. I, right now, I don't care. I just don't want to give these pricks my money anymore because this morning, I think they cost me money. So any other time, they would have been given short, sharp shrift. Mm-hmm. But he got me when I'd been let down by whatever it was that he sold. And I, I was emotional, pissed off, annoyed. Yeah. So that's why when you're prospecting, you're going to find that they're sitting there eating a sandwich. You've got to talk about what you fix. And then they suddenly say, yeah, I do recognize it. Or, you know, we have that as an issue or we've tried to fix that. Then we can get them into a proper conversation. That's why it's important because the journey has to start emotionally. If they just invite you in, out of intellectual curiosity, you're kissing a frog. Yeah, no one wants to do that. So you mentioned something interesting earlier, something I often talk about when we're talking about websites and SEOs to prospects, that you don't want to drive a ton of prospects through the pipeline that aren't actually a fit to do business with you. So like you said, the purpose of cold calling isn't to get everyone to say yes and agree to a meeting, because that would waste your time and theirs. You're just going to go through a qualification initial meeting discovery and realize that you're not a good fit for everyone. Um, Just like with your website, you don't want to drive as many leads as possible because not everyone might be able to do business with you, afford your solution, be a good fit, whatever. So with that said, Hmm. what are some quick best practices, let's say, for the opener of your cold call? Um, How do you recommend it? I think everybody knows the one that I I, I most um, yeah yeah I, I just want to hear it because I know a lot of people disagree with it and I've seen a lot on LinkedIn I know a lot lately. of people disagree yeah of course they do because they disagree with it because their mum won't let them do it that's the real reason it's it's not because it doesn't work it's their mum says you can't say that hmm. yeah and this is the thing I stopped listening to my mum a long time ago I love my mum I love my dad they gave me great advice. But when I realized that they were costing me a fortune because I was listening to all the rules they gave me at a kid that don't apply as a grown-up, I realized how free I was. So the people that say they don't like it, it's because they don't know how to do it or they've done it really badly and it's bombed. Um, And it's like anything. Salesmen are actors. Something's coming right and bright. Sorry, folks. It's just uh, it's just coming right. It's not I'm being ennobled or sainted or anything. <laughs> it's uh, it's just the sun. It's, I can just see it. But um, what was I saying? Yeah, it's it's... So the opening line I use, I've got several that I like to use. So I need to change them. And it all depends on, you know, what I'm calling on. But the one that I prefer is, and I, again, this works predominantly on decision makers. 
This works on people in the C-suite, as they say. So I don't phone anyone below director level. If you're phoning below director level, you're wasting your time. Yes, occasionally some managers have the unilateral ability to spend money, but the word manage should tell you what they do. They don't make decisions. So phone at director level. And the thing about directors, these are tough people. They're confident people. They're assertive people. These are people that make decisions for a living. And they got to the top because they made good decisions. Sometimes they made bad decisions and they learned from them. So they're decision makers. They're autonomous. And they're their own person and they have a very strong sense of concept and identity. So when you phone someone up like this, I want to deliberately poke them in a way that's going to make them react. And if you phone up a decision maker and you tell them to do something, their reaction is no. You don't tell me what to do. It's the human condition. We're rebellious by nature. We don't like to be told what to do. So when I phone up, the phone answers and I go, hey, is that Sam? And you go, yeah. You're Sam, look, you are going to hate me. This is actually a cold call. So do you want to hang up or let me have 30 seconds? And when you say to someone, do you want to hang up? The reaction most of the time, it's not 100% because you don't know what frame of mind or what's going on in that person's world when you phone them. But most of the time, 95% of the time, if you deliver that well with assertiveness and confidence at director level, you often get a bit of a chuckle. <laughs> you know, you get a... <laughs> You know, yeah, no, 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 go on then, you know, or it depends, what's it about? Yeah, yeah, so you get permission, they give you permission to talk to them. And then the other bit after that is, I don't say, can I have, or please, is it okay? I give them a command. I say, let me have. It's a command. So do you want to hang up or let me have? So I'm commanding them with the second bit. And it works on a psychological level because the instant reaction is no, I don't want to hang up. Yeah, and then let me have 30 seconds. And then you'll get three answers. They'll laugh. Ha <laughs> ha, quite like that. Go on then. Some will say, well, what's it about? Which is kind of a weird thing to say because you've just said, can I have 30 seconds to explain what it's about? So it's, 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 it's they don't know what to do here. They're caught up. They want to say no, but you've caught say, them. How much of this is because it's still very unusual to hear this type of cold call intro? And how much of it is weighted on the way you actually deliver? And your The delivery is key. If you say... um. I'll be up front. This is um, this is a this is a cold call. Um, do you want to hang up or can I have thirty seconds? They're gonna think loser, wimp. Remember, if you're talking at decision maker level, you've got to be like your prospect. You've got to mirror them, and you have to sound like them. And that's very hard for most people in sales because most people in sales are young men and women in their twenties, maybe early thirties. They don't own two homes in a boat. They aren't technically successful by the wider world standards. And now you're phoning someone who probably is successful. So you don't act or sound like them. You have to learn to create that character. I had to learn it because I wasn't like that. So it's tiring to be a good actor because every time you pick up that phone, you've got to become that same character just for a few seconds and then you can go into a different role. So yeah, it's very important that you deliver it well. Yeah, yeah, and that makes sense. And because we want to, we've got a few other topics we've got to move yeah. through. Any other quick, quick pointers on the cold call in terms of you mentioned earlier? You typically involve three common pain points or problems that your customers will typically have. So yeah, is, is that the next step, or if we could just well, the hardest of... thing for a salesman to do is put himself into his prospect's shoes and see the world through their eyes. So most salespeople always talk in marketing speak or solution speak. We yep. help companies do X, Y, Z. We have this proprietary system that can do. We achieve blah, blah, blah. Uh, people tell us they have. But your prospect's never thinking in that language. So I can't phone up and say, hi, I'm a sales trainer, and I give people a systematic, psychological-based approach that will enable your salespeople to get out. And he goes, oh, well, it's funny you should say that because I was just thinking about that this morning. No. What is a guy that could use me probably bitching or moaning about that I could fix? And I know the number one thing. I phone any MD or CEO, go, look, you, you, you've probably got great guys, but you're maybe a bit frustrated that they're reluctant or not motivated to pick up the phone and prospect. And they say to you, yes, I recognize that. That's what we're after. We're after what they see in their everyday life. So you've got to reduce it to that. And that's hard. I, every client I get has to do that exercise. And they struggle because they write down what they fix. No, 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 not what you fix. Write down what your prospect's viewing in their everyday life that you fix. 
oh, I don't know. So how can you phone someone up and honestly say you understand them when you can't even view their problem through their eyes? So that's a key takeaway. And if you get that right, your prospecting calls will work so much better than the vomit you're probably spewing on them now. Yeah, it informs your marketing a lot. We've done a lot of past episodes where we've talked to marketers and basically shared about how you can run customer interviews. So you interview your current best customers, find out the problems they actually came to you with, what they wanted to fix, find out the ones that are the most common, the juiciest, and the ones that actually bring cash flow, and then use those in your sales material, whether that's in your calls, your website, your yeah. marketing material, and all that good stuff. So that makes sense. Um, and just to wrap this up, are we... Yeah. Are we constantly pushing for the meeting? So if, if we've had a problem that they've said, yeah, that, that resonates, and are we, are we just looking to dig deeper on that and eventually close out with saying, like, can we set up an appointment next Tuesday no. or something like that? Or? I, I do not use the word, can we have a meeting or can we book in an appointment? Um, I can't remember the last time I ever asked anyone for an appointment or a meeting. Um, because the way I structure my calls, it's not possible. The, the call ends. I've done my my questions to get them slightly emotional. Because the last question I ask is, can I ask you a last question before you hang up? They go, I go, have you given up trying to fix this? Now, because I've done my job well, 99% of the time I get, well, well, no. And as soon as I get that, that's it. That's the end of the prospecting call. I then go into with a very simple line. I go, well, look, I'll be honest. I don't know if I can fix this for you. But I've worked with a lot of companies with these problems and we've managed to eliminate it for a lot of them. Not all of them, but most of them. Now, let's pretend, and I'm, like I say, I'm not saying I can, but let's pretend we could fix this for you. And when you saw our solution, you genuinely believed it would work. Is there any reason you wouldn't invite me in to explore that further? So you asked to be invited in. Yep. I never asked for a meeting or an appointment. No, no, because that's imposing myself on it. So is there any reason you wouldn't invite me in to explore that further? And they all say, no, not really. Because it's hard to say no. It's really hard to say no to the way that's phrased. I don't know if I can fix it for you, but let's pretend you did believe we could fix it. Is there any reason you wouldn't explore that further? No, I can't see why not. You know, it's, it's almost impossible to say, yeah, I would actually. <laughs> So they say no. And as soon as they say that, I go straight in with another question. Have you got your diary there? And they're going, yeah, yeah. I go, what date are you looking at? Now I give these mini commands. What date are you looking at? So never ask for a meeting, never ask for an appointment. It's almost the equivalent of saying to somebody, here, pass me your wallet. What happens to you the moment says, here, pass me your wallet? There's that flinch. What? And all of a sudden, the barrier goes up. That's what happens when you say, well, look, can we schedule an appointment? All of a sudden, the prospect goes, uh, 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 and then they half-heartedly commit to it because they kind of feel they have to for social niceties point. And then the moment they hang up, they think, oh, bollocks to that. A lot of this is in the small things, it sounds like, from the tone of your voice yeah, and using yeah. commanding words and phrasing yes. things in a certain way can make quite a big difference. Selling is the art of communication. That is all this is. This is two human beings talking. And my job is to make someone comfortable. If they're not comfortable, they won't move forwards with me. Salespeople don't realize how uncomfortable they make people. Yeah. They are shockers. And all you got to do is watch The Apprentice, which is currently on TV. If you want to see how the world views salespeople, that's it. So if you look, sound, or act like one of them, don't be surprised people think you're a complete tool. <laughs> No disrespect to anyone on the show because I know it's purely made for TV and they're probably asked to be complete pricks. But you get my point. Good, good, cool. So that's cold calling in a nutshell. We've, we've covered yeah. some kind of basics of that. So let's push it forward. Let's go yeah. to the, let's say we've set up a, a next meeting and the times right. are in now, that's most likely going to be a Zoom session. Perhaps it's face-to-face -face if you're local Perhaps. or if you're if in field sales or whatever you do needs face-to-face -face consulting. Let's talk about this appointment. Let's do it on the basis that we're selling something where perhaps we have cold call. We then set the appointment. The appointment is, let's say, a fact-finding discovery session to determine if we can actually help this person with a project. And let's say it's a phase before we then go into a demo or a presentation call. Right. So let's so call this it a discovery is, session. I, I call this the sales meeting. Yeah, people love giving all these fancy terms. <laughs> This is the sales meeting. This is the one meeting you've got to get right. 
You know, you, you spend all those hours phoning people. You finally got through to someone. They finally said, all right, maybe you got something. Let's have a chat. And then you go in and you ruin it with some sort of fact-finding discovery call. No, this is the sale. This is the moment that you have to stand apart from everybody else and act and behave in a manner that makes them feel comfortable with you. So this to me is the most important meeting. And I think if you get this right, your sales cycle is drastically reduced. Every client I've worked with, when they nail this first meeting, you suddenly go from having another two or three after to maybe just one more. Sometimes you can even close at the end of that meeting to, for the next step. So this is the crucial meeting. And this meeting... And this is why it's so important. And this is why salespeople will struggle with this. But again, we go back to the concept. Most salespeople work for somebody and they're working on behalf of somebody. So they always go in in a relatively servile, servitudal mindset. Yep. And you get in front of a prospect and your mindset is, is well, I'm just so grateful to be here. I, I, you know, it's real. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for giving up your time. So instantly you're in this begging Oliver Twist bowl sort of situation. And so instantly, instantly you're putting, you, you, you haven't even created a power of equality here. So the mindset of a, of a salesman is very hard to develop. But if you watch the owner of a company, some, some are very good. But most people at the top, they're quite blasé in how they're approaching. So they come from this, they know, because it's my business, I can walk away. I don't have to say yes to this. So they have a better self-concept and self-awareness, whereas people below them don't. So in this meeting, you need to, the mindset is very simple. I'm not here to demonstrate or convince to you why I can help you. And the reason I'm doing that is because I know what we do works. We've got an entire business dedicated to doing what we do, and it works. So the problem isn't I'm here to prove to you that this works. I'm here to figure out if you're someone that we should let buy from us. Because that is the problem salespeople don't have. They're always in there trying to get some to want to like them or convince them they need what they have. No, 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 no. If you have problems we fix, if you accept you have problems we fix, and you can convince me you actually want to fix them, then we're going to be able to help you. So I'm not here to prove to you that we can help you. You need to convince me that you're someone we should work with. And that mindset fundamentally changed how you act and behave. Now, you're not arrogant. You're not a twat. You do it in a way that makes people comfortable. But if you go into it with that mindset, I'm here to figure out if we should work with you because there are more reasons for you not to buy from me than there are to buy from me. We're going to figure out if any of those apply. And if we can't get over them, it's over. If we can get over them, then we'll move forwards. So that 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 to me is a fundamental thing. You're there not to convince anyone that they need you. I know what we do works. The only thing you have over me, prospect, is choice. You get to choose who you give your money to. But other than that, that's all you have. Your money, I don't need it. We do well. We don't yeah. need your money. We like your money. Don't get me wrong, but we don't need your money. So that is the fundamental thing about this meeting. It's not about you convincing them why they should move forwards. It's getting them to convince you that you should move forwards with them. That mindset throws most people in sales because they, yeah. they can't do it. It's just, no, I can't do that. No, 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 no. I, I've just got to show up, throw up and hope. Yeah, that's it. I think. I'm not sure if this is always the case, but certainly when I started in sales, I thought if I could get that first meeting, then it was my chance to say, look, I'm so thankful for the meeting. This is our company history. This is why we're so great. This is all the awards we've won. And this is why we're a great fit to help you. But in fact, like you say, what you work out is if you've done sales for more than a couple of years, not everyone's a great fit to do to, to work with you. Some might not have the money. Some might just be annoying and you don't want to work with them. Some might not, have, like you say, have problems that you can fix. Um, and some might not believe you can actually help them. Um, so in this meeting that we've secured, that we've mm. kind of grinded away to to get on the books because they've got a problem or problems that we can help with, what are some some best practices? What are some ways that we should perhaps start it? Some some goals we should have in mind, and some ways that we can progress. Right. So the key to again, the key to success in all things in life, not just sales, but uh, is no attachment to the outcome. I cannot. I cannot, I cannot stress that enough. And it's easy to say. Let's, let's, not, let's not BS each other. It's very easy to say these trite lines, you know. 
Yeah, it's very easy. Yeah, just mm. don't have no attachment to the outcome. That's easier said than done. How do you do that? Well, that's that's a lot of self discipline, practice, and technique. You can't just will you know you can't will yourself thin. Yeah, you know, just have a good mind to yeah, just every day say I'm thin, I'm thin, I'm beautiful, I'm thin, I'm thin. Are you putting a fork down and going to the gym? Well, no. Well, then you're going to be fat for the rest of your life. Yeah. So, so it's very easy to say think yourself thin and all that crap. So you've got to start behaving differently. And the first thing you need to do is no attachment to the outcome. So when I get in front of a prospect, I go in there not with the intention of selling because I'm not there to sell. I'm there to figure out if I can move forwards with this person, which means there are certain things I need to understand. So I'm only interested in getting the information from them that I need to determine if I can move forwards with them and if they can move forwards with me. So the outcomes are relevant. Just like a lawyer, day one of the trial. You know, what's the outcome? Well, the outcome is for me to do the absolute best job that I can. Whatever the jury decides, I have no idea what juries do. Yep. When they go out there, they do their own thing. All I do know is from experience that if I do all these things really, really well, statistically, there's a good chance that we'll get an acquittal or we'll get the, the verdict that we want, but it's not guaranteed. But... The only time you can hold me up against the wall and say I failed is if we look at what I did and I did it wrong. If I was negligent or incompetent in how we got to the outcome we didn't want, then you have right to come at me. But if I did everything right, but we still got an outcome we didn't want, well, that's not my fault. It just wasn't meant to be. And some people don't get that. They seem to think that everyone should want to buy from them. No, you're going at it with the wrong mindset. So you need to... First of all, no attachment to the outcome. The purpose of this meeting is for us to figure out, can you convince me you want to fix your problem? So I look for five things. Do you have a problem I can fix? So I need to figure that out. Second, do they acknowledge and accept they have the problem? Okay. Thirdly, can they convince you they want to fix it? Now, those three are the emotional bits. And those three are the important bits because you can meet people that recognize they have a problem but they don't want to fix it. And it doesn't matter how logically brilliant, no matter how much money you can save them, no matter how much better you can make them, if they don't actually care or there's no reason to fix it, then they won't. And salespeople miss that. And they come away. I don't get it. We could have done so much for them. We could have done all these. I just, I just don't understand. We, we, well, you didn't sell the value. No, you did. They just didn't care. So they, if they can't convince you they want to fix that problem, it will go nowhere. So you've got yeah, to get those three things. A couple of things on that before we jump into the, mm. the final two of the five. So how do we – so you said you, you don't like calling it a discovery call, which is fine. You call it whatever the heck you want. Call it a sales meeting. Yeah. But how do we position this so prospects – don't feel like we're running a Q&A. We're not going through our company's qualification sheet, rolling off 20 questions that identify whether this prospect is a good fit to become a customer or not. Um, how do we position these qualification questions around their problems, them acknowledging they have a problem that we can fix and progressing them across the sales cycle without them feeling that we're doing so? Well, that's an entire training course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an entire training course. You've just, uh, I mean, that's the, that's, the, <laughs> that's the meat and two veg of the entire thing, yeah. right? So the, I'm not going to be able to do it justice in a few minutes. But the, 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 the fact of the matter is, again, it's easy to say these things. It's harder to do them. It has to be a conversation. Again, that's a very trite thing to say. The problem is, is most salespeople have questions designed to elicit intellectual answers and designed to gather information that enable them to talk about them or their product. That's why they're bad. And they ask questions in a manner that can come across as a cross-examination. Most salespeople, most human beings, it's not just limited to salespeople, most human beings are terrible at asking questions because we ask what's on our mind without filtering it and without thinking, how is this going to be received by the other person? And you've all been in a situation, a business or a personal situation where you've said something and then the other person says something back to you and then you found yourself, yeah, but that's not what I meant. Well, whose fault is that? It's not the person's fault because obviously how you communicated what you meant to communicate, you clearly didn't communicate it. So selling is about the art of communicating. So when you ask questions, first of all, you have to ask relevant questions that are designed to move people to emotion. And those questions aren't intellectual ones. So talk me through your current processes. No, that's, that's, a, that's a pointless, mind-numbingly stupid. It has a place 
but not at the beginning, not in the not at the sal meeting. It'll come out. What you want to do is ask questions designed. I call it the pub conversation. Could you imagine if you're a you're you're a salesman that sold legal services, right? And you're at the pub with a mate, and he says, "I'm thinking about getting a divorce." A typical salesman would go, "I know a good divorce lawyer." You know, that's that's what the salesman would do. You know, oh, I know a good divorce. But if you were just a mate that wasn't selling legal services, and your friend said to you, "I'm thinking about getting a divorce," you'd look at him and you go, "Why? What? What? What, what do you What do you mean?" And then the guy has to explain to you, well, you know, things haven't been going so well for the last few months. What do you mean they haven't been going so well? What's been going on? And he, uh, and, he, and he's he's genuinely curious and trying to understand what is going on. He's, oh, I know a good lawyer. I know a good lawyer. No, no, no. That's what the salesman did. Oh, yeah. Okay. And how long were you married? Oh, yeah, six years. Do you guys own any assets together? That's what the crappy salesman. But the mate is saying, well, have you considered, have you considered counseling? Uh, yeah, what about just taking some time out? Uh, you know, maybe, maybe a quick. He's giving all the alternatives to divorce. But the sales guy, I know a good lawyer. I know a good lawyer. You know, and it's a, so it's, 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 it's getting him to appreciate that the conversation you have with a prospect has to be conversational. It has to be one where I'm exploring and trying to find out what the hell is going on here. You've invited yeah. me in. Let's find out if there really is something here. Now, people think because they're sitting opposite a guy who earns 120K a year, he's got a 3,000 pound suit on and he looks serious, that you can't talk to him like a human being. You can, because underneath that 3,000 pound suit is a guy that has the same weaknesses, fears, looks in the mirror, says, God, I'm getting old. I need to lose a bit of weight. Same, 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 same. But you don't see that. You just see CEO, successful business. But, oh, 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 I better be off to answer his questions. Oh, 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 I better come across as intelligent and smart. And yeah. you don't. That, that, so that's the, the, that, the nub of this meeting is getting to the heart of what's going on. And you can't do that if you've just got a series of intellectual questions or really lame questions. What keeps you up at night, sir? Oh, my goodness. I mean, Too many beers on. at the pub. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's terrible. It, Oh, anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, gen genuine, I genuine curiosity. Um, genuine curiosity. I think what I find anyway is if I speak to a sales rep and they're asking, actually asking me those kind of questions, it differentiates them quite a lot. Um, because like you say, most people just want to throw up and show up and try and shove their product or service down your neck before you can even kind of string a sentence together. Mm. So if someone's actually showing interest in what your current position is, what your current state is, why have you even thought about that? Why aren't you trying to fix it yourself? Why haven't you tried a similar solution? And why you've gone through X, Y, Z? And what's brought you to this po moment? And they're actually thinking, well, this person actually cares about helping me rather mm. than just trying to shove their product down my neck. Less, uh, yeah, it's, I just want to get to the truth because the truth will help me determine if you're suitable for our stuff. Because mm -hmm. um, uh, like I said, most salespeople are like air hostesses without the drinks. <laughs> You know, they've got that forced smile and, oh, yeah, mm. they just go along with it no matter what. they just got to be polite and civil. That's what salespeople are like. You know, they're deferencing themselves to their prospect. Whereas I'm sitting in there and I'll talk to them like I've known them for 20 years. I won't be overly familiar. Hey, mate, how are you? you know, nothing like that. But And I can talk to them on a human level. But I don't understand. When you say you're thinking about getting sales training, what do you mean by thinking? Because this is also people say to me, how do you get good at asking questions? I don't have a list of pre-scripted questions that I ask. All my questions are based on everything that the prospect's saying. And it's often I listen to their words. Because remember, this is all about communications. The higher up you go, the smarter you go. They use words for particular reasons. So I challenge anything that sounds opaque. So if somebody says to me, well, we've been thinking about getting sales training. I go, well, when you say thinking, what do you mean? Because what does that mean? We've just come up with the idea this morning. We've actually been talking to other sales trainers. Uh, what does thinking mean? So then, then they say, well, when I say thinking, it's been a conversation we've been having over the last few months. Why have you been having that conversation? Well, we've noticed a dip in our sales. Well, what's changed? in the last few months for the dip to happen. Well, that's it. We don't know. Well, when you asked your sales guys, why are they not performing? What did they say? Well, I've not asked them that. Why did you not ask them that? So this is how that, so every question I ask is predicated on what they've said. That's why people don't get upset or that's why people don't stop me asking questions because I'm not cross-examining them. I'm actually just responding to what they've said. Yeah.
Yeah, and yeah. that's a skill, and that's a very hard skill to master because to get good at it, you've got to have a lot of terrible, terrible sales meetings. And I have. <laughs> I yeah. have. Getting, getting to the heart of the issue. Heart so of the issue. How, I guess, two two ways to almost wrap this up before we mm. talk about the last five points. How What happens if you've had a, a bit of a chat, you've gone through some of these points, you've dug a bit deeper, yeah. and you realize that this prospect is not someone that you can help? How should we close that out? And on the flip side, how do we then, if we think we can help them, convince, or how do we t- tell them to tell us that they believe that we can help them? No. Ah, well, two. Well, if you get to the end of it and you conclude you can't help them, it's easy. You just tell them. I'll be honest. I can't help you. Do you know the reaction you get? Do you know how hard it is to get people not to work with you when you tell them you can't work with them? It, 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 it blows my mind. Look, I can't help you because they look at you like a child. It's like, <laughs> why? You go, well, look, it's because, and then you give them your, and some will say, yeah, 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 but we can overcome. They'll actually start fighting with you. But if you really don't want to work with them, you just plant your feet. Now, the other scenario, you want to work with them. You know you can help them. Now, I would have done a lot of stuff at the beginning. See, salespeople leave the hard stuff normally to the end. I've already got them to agree at the beginning of the meeting that what happens next is what happens next. That's very important to do. We haven't discussed it and we won't. So when I get to the end of the meeting, I never ask for anything. All I say, I wrap up all my meetings the same way. And I know when I've got to the point, because I've been doing this long enough and I know my prospects and I know my world inside out. When I get to the end, when I get to the point where I know it's appropriate, I always look at my watch. I don't wear a watch. It's all acting. You sort of look at your wrist because that's the motion for time because body language is what we read. So I look, I go, look, you know what? I'm conscious of time. We've been doing this for about just over an hour now. Look, we're going to have to wrap this up. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Based on the questions I've asked and the answers I've given you during this meeting, do you believe I can help you? That's it. Now, if the answer is no or I don't know, I've screwed up. And I know I've screwed up and it's probably too late to rectify. So then for me personally, I will leave that meeting and go back over it in my head and go, where did I go wrong? What did I not do? And I'll fix it. But if they say yes, I go, do you mind if I ask why? And then they all say the same thing. Well, I've enjoyed our conversation. It's quite obvious you understand our problems. Uh, I I can see that you've got experience. I think my guys are going to like you. I I like the way you do things. Um, And I, yeah, I I just, I just, yeah, I I just do believe you can help me. And I go, okay, so what do you want to do? And they go, well, you said at the beginning, the next step would be we do da-da-da. I go, okay, do you want to do that? Uh, Yeah. So I never ask for the order, just like I never ask for an appointment. If I've done my job well, all I do is, do you believe I can help you? Yes. Then there should be no reason why we can't move forwards. Yeah. It's that easy. But getting there, you can't just do that. You can't do a really shite job and then do that. It won't work. It's all about how you get to the ending. It's not whether or not you get there. It's how you get there. Just like a professional sportsman, they're not focused on the end. They're focused on every stroke of every bit of that race, making sure they're doing it absolutely perfectly. That's all they're focused on. And if they do all of those right in a row, they should win. But they might not because the other guy's better at the strokes. Damn it. That's how it works. Yeah. So with that said, I mean, up to... I guess to just reinforce what you said about that, I'm guessing you're talking about some kind of upfront contract where you say at the start of the presentation that this can go kind of one or two or three ways. Yeah, that's a rather dated term. Yeah, but yeah, you need some sort of agreement at the beginning as to what will happen next. And yep. you have to lock it in. Um, I've seen these sorts of things. That a lot of people do very weak, wishy-washy things. You know, and what we'll do is we'll set aside a few minutes at the end and we'll agree a next step. The problem is, is if you don't define the next step right at the beginning, when you get to the end and you tell them it, they're still able to say, no, nah, I don't like it. I don't want to do that as a next step. And then you've just spent 45 minutes talking to someone for a next step that could never take place. So most people do very weak ones because they're scared. And this is why you don't want to tell them what the next step is. If you tell them what the next step is early on and they say, I don't want to do that, your fear is, oh, but I won't get to spend 45 minutes trying to convince them they should. So you don't do it. 
So I make it clear. I say to them, and if we can't agree, we'll set aside a few minutes at the end and we'll set aside a next step. Sound fair? And they all go, yeah, yeah, but I'm fair with that. I go, okay, fair enough. Oh, actually, one last thing. I've only got one next step in my world. Shall I tell you what it is? Nobody ever says, nah, let's leave it as a surprise. <laughs> they all say, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. And then I tell them. And this is a mini sales pitch because I'm selling that because my next step's always pay. So there's a figure attached to this. So you, this is where you learn to sell quotes and proposals. The next step is this, and it's going to cost you two and a half K. So knowing that if we don't say no to each other, the next step is going to be an investment of two and a half K. Do you still want to have this meeting? And you'll get stumbled. No, there's no way in God's green earth that I'm fine. So what were you expecting was going to happen by the end of this meeting? Well, I just assumed you're going to come in and tell me how to fix my problem for free. Yeah, I know. I'm not. Now, I'm willing to walk at that point. But just to all those listening to this saying, ah, that won't work. I've only once in my entire life doing this had somebody literally outright say, there's no way I'd pay that. Everyone has said, they can lie to me. They'll always say, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable. I, I knew this was going to cost money. I didn't think anything would be free. And you'll be amazed at prospects how many will say that. The fear is that they won't. But I've had clients phone me up. I had one sold tech. And I taught him how not to do demos. We eliminated demos. Demos are pointless. And he sold proposals, scoping documents. And the, yep. It took him six months to pluck up the courage. Then he phoned me up and he said, I did it. I sold one. I go, well, what what'd you get? He goes, five grand. I go, get out of here. I go, what's the biggest takeaway you took from the experience? He goes, well, this, the thing is, it was his reaction. I go, what do you mean? So I did everything you said. I structured it the way you said. And then I said to him, and, and that's going to cost you 5K. I go, and he, he just looked at me and said, seems reasonable. And he goes, why have I never done this before? Because you're too chicken shit to ask because you were always told you've got to do stuff for free to win. Be you've got to build a relationship. So, yeah. It might even start at a higher level, right? Because I actually started doing similar after one of our calls two years ago. Great. For specific projects, I sell proposals or assessment documents. Yeah. And it also filters out the time wasters. So if someone's willing to invest in that, we might sell them a larger project and discount the price of the assessment off the end oh, and project yeah. with that in mind. So it, it certainly does work. I've sold it, it to see so I can out, back it up. It weeds out time wasters, but this is it. Salespeople don't care about time wasters as long as they can stick something in their pipeline that has a 65% chance of closing. It means they don't have to prospect and they get to live on and, hope. And hope is the currency of crap salesmen. Yeah, and it might be a problem with leadership as well, especially if you've got KPIs like ship this many proposals oh, or get out this many yeah. quotes. And it's yeah, like if, yeah. if you've got that pressure above your head and it's almost counterintuitive to some to some instances. Well, most say. sales managers were good order takers that didn't want to take orders anymore. Yeah. 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 Sadly. <laughs> we know that, right? We know Sadly. that. Yeah. Indeed. So we 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 progress. I mean that to what we've just covered there covers a good chunk of what you should be doing on a demo, really, doesn't it? Um Independent. I, I, I never use the word demo. Oh, oh no, no. Don't, what is a, a demo? You may as well take your holiday photos and show somebody those. That's the equivalent of a demo. It's the commercial version of your holiday snaps. Yeah. And people say, well, we got to do demos. What you do if you tell someone, can we phone you and do a demo? Stop doing it. No, the next step would be for us to figure out whether or not we can move forwards. During that process, we may be able to show you some of the system to, to feed off, but we may not get there. Mm. That's what you need to start doing. But if you say, can we have, I saw some guy on a YouTube channel saying, uh, uh, he asked for 18 minutes so that they can do a demo to prove to you. So what the, what? They go away, you know? 18 minutes for me to talk at you about why I'm so brilliant. That's why I love salespeople. They're forward thinkers. They created Instagram long before it existed. Yeah, see, sales meaning Instagram for sales folk. Yeah, it's just where you get to be narcissistic and self-loving. Yeah. Instagram just uh, gave it to the world. Mm. Mm. So do you think, I mean, this would, this would vary, vary massively depending on the, I guess, the sales cycle of the product, mm. perhaps piece of tech, whatever it is you're selling. Do you think that we should try and link that all into that one call there? So what well, I'm saying... Again, it's like, 
there are there are challenges. I mean, yeah. uh, you've got enterprise sales, and obviously enterprise sales are selling massive bits of kit. There's a variety of different stakeholders that have to be involved, and obviously that's not a one or two call close. But the the primary function of a salesman is to always be in control, and you have to design and structure. So every meeting can always end with a clearly agreed next step and consequences if nothing happens. The problem yep. is that salespeople are scared to get commitments from, from, from prospect. They're scared that if they ask them for a commitment, that the, the prospect will walk. And I would rather they walk than be strung along for six months only to get to the end to realize that the CEO hadn't even been told that this project was being considered. And the moment he heard about it, he said no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I want to I want to wrap this this episode today up with two yes. things: follow ups and knowing when to walk away from a prospect, potential customer. They, the two might be linked. So, I mean, based following on what up, you've, so following up someone you've met. Yeah, let's say a sales follow up. So perhaps let's give the instance that maybe we maybe we cocked up. Let's say okay. let's say we we had a we we've arranged a meeting. We've gone through it. Or maybe we got strung along. Um, maybe we, we did a meeting. One of the founders of the company was there. It yeah. all went well. We identified yeah. they had a problem we could fix. Um, they agreed yeah. that we, we did. We shared pricing. We shared all the good stuff, what the next steps are. And they said, that all sounds great, but I need to speak to my co-founder. And then they ghost you. Let's, let's reconnect next week. Yeah, 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 yeah. Crickets. Silence. Right. Hay, hay bells are going through. You're, you're crying because that was the 10 grand you needed to hit quota. Okay, so this is what you got to do. And again, this takes courage to do because you're going to be scared to do it. And your mum's going to be saying, you can't say that. You can't ask these questions. Well, you can because I do it all the time and no one ever gets upset because I always operate in a world of reality and logic. So if that should happen to me, it doesn't happen much. But if, if, if I get to the point <laughs> where they actually say, they actually get to the point and they say, uh, you know what, Benjamin, I, I, I don't want to give a no, but I don't want to give a yes. I honestly, this is not a fob off. They do all this drama and acting around this, right? It's not a fob off, Benjamin. Um, I, I do need to go and blah, 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 blah. I go, fair enough. Okay, so why don't we agree this? Why don't you reach out to me next week? And they go, fine. I go, okay, so what day can I expect to hear from you by next week? And they go, you'll hear from me by Friday. I go, what time Friday? And they go, End of play. I go, is that four, five o'clock? Five o'clock. Okay. So let's agree this then. If I haven't heard from you at five o'clock by Friday, what do I do? Do I chase you or just assume it's over? They all say, well, chase me. I go, fair enough. How many times? And they go, just once. You just have to do it the right. They go, but I promise you, I will get back to you. Now, I don't believe prospects are lying to you at that moment when they say, I promise I'll get back to you. Because I do believe in the moment they actually genuinely mean it. The reality is, though, once they leave and they get caught up in their world and their lives and everything going on, you are the last person. And because you're a salesman, you don't have to keep a commitment to a salesman. So you just literally, I call salesmen a poo sticks. For those of you watching who don't know what a poo stick is. A poo stick, you would have done this as a child. You know, you stand on a bridge with a stick and you throw the stick in and then you run to the other side and you race it. Well, we're poo sticks because once we leave, they just chuck us into that river and we just drift off into endless time, right? Never to be thought of again. So I say, how many times? And they go, no, I promise you. I go, no, I appreciate that. I go, can I be up front with you? I know the whirlwind of life can take over and you may genuinely not get back to me. So why don't we agree this? If I don't hear from you, I'll phone you. If I get you, you can give me your answer. If I don't get you, I'll leave you a message. And it's up to you to call me back. And if you don't call me back, I'll just assume it's over. How does that sound? No, yeah, yeah, that's fine. I I'm fine with that. So I now know, come 5 o'clock Friday, if I haven't heard from them, I just make my call. I get their voicemail. Say, hey, Sam, it's Benjamin. Just as, as agreed, didn't get your call. This is the message. If you still want to move this forward, reach out. But otherwise... I'm going to assume you've managed to fix your problem. All the best. Bye. That's it. Two things happen. You never hear from them or they phone you back. Yep. So essentially Very what great. we're saying is we agree. We really drill down because that is something you hear in sales so much, isn't it? Yeah. Like you, don't, no matter what it is, so there's, there's often times, even if you've said, even if you ask like, who's involved in the process, every now and then surprises do come along 
or people yeah. don't perhaps share all the information that you needed. Yeah, no, and like you say, they might say, we need to get someone else involved or we're actually speaking to another vendor and we'll, we'll let you know next Friday. So what you're saying is really drill down and say, well, what time yeah. next Friday? Okay. There's an irony with salespeople because they'll spend 30 minutes trying to convince you to use them. But the one moment they need to have a pair of balls and actually be a little bit pushy is the bit yeah. we've just done. And then they wimp out because oh, 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 the little kids, I don't know what to accept them. I think it's gone really well. I don't, I don't, don't want to scare them off. No, this is the moment. To, look, look, buddy, my t- I'm not saying this, so just for the record, this is what I'm thinking. Look, buddy, my time's just as important. If you don't want to tell me no, I'm just going to by default assume it's a no. And I know you don't have to tell me no because I'm a salesman and you owe me nothing once this meeting is over. I know that. So unless we agree you owe me something and the consequences of not going through with it, then I can't blame you for being treated like crap. If you get treated like crap as a salesman, it's your fault because you let it happen. Stop letting it happen. Grow a pair. Yeah. yeah or yeah. transition. I don't know what it is. <laughs> okay. We won't get into that just now. But um, with that said, does that mean we need to have, have completely ditched because we're getting that agreement on whether they'll um on what time we should call back if they don't respond to the call, if they don't answer it, we're basically saying, look, we're we're gonna close your account. That, that's it as far as we can send unless you get back to me or unless you answer that call. Does that mean there's no need for email follow-up? Have you been eaten by an alien? Have you given no, up no, on no, the project? No. So again, again, I'm not a complete numpty because you see, I'll tell you a true story. And this Please is because this is, this is life is funny. You don't know what happens to a human being once you've left. And I, I had that happen. Um, the guy said, look, leave it with me. I'll be in touch next week. He didn't get in touch. I, I did what I agreed. Okay. And I heard nothing. Okay. Right? So about three weeks later, I always do a nice, like, hey, Brian, I never did get that call. I can only assume you actually managed to solve this problem elsewhere. I'm going to close the file on this now for good. But I wish you every success. And this guy got back to me. And he said, Ben's been really, 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 very sorry. Um, I've actually been out of action for the last couple of months. I was in an accident that involved the death of a child. Bloody hell. You know, and it's like, you see, so I can't, that's why I never get angry with prospects if they don't get back because you have no idea what's going on in their life. You have no right to get angry with them. But if you agreed with them that you're going to end it if you don't hear from them, then you walk away. Follow up in a few weeks with a, look, I haven't heard from you. Obviously, you've managed to fix your problem. I'm going to close the file on this. And again, if you send that, close the file. It's a lovely little phrase. I'm going to close the file on this. You get two responses again. You get nothing, which means it's definitely dead. Or you get someone come back and say, no, 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 no. Look, sorry. I, I Honestly, we've just had, we've just been investigated by HMRC and everything's been put on hold for the last six weeks. Stuff happens. So no, I don't say you just stick two fingers up, go screw yourself, sir, and then walk off. You know, don't be a dick. But what I'm saying is this is about you not being a needy, beggy, pleady, desperate, just touching base to see how you are. Oh, God, go away. Just in the neighborhood. No, you weren't. You made a three-hour detour to pass my office. It's pathetic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's essentially what you're saying is get that agreement on the call when you will call back and what you will do next. Perhaps give it a few weeks. Give it a few weeks. Drop an email like that. See Drop if they, an email. I'm going to close the file now. Yeah. Yeah. If not, leave it. What What are your thoughts? Just to wrap up on the Chris Chris Voss email. I don't know if you've heard it. Where you basically just no, put, no. Well, I, I read his book, but what's the Chris Voss email? Is this great a new book. thing? Yeah. Well, I don't. I don't think it's new. He does talk about it in his book. Um, Josh Bourne and him have talked about it as well. You basically put. I think the subject line is just their name, and then you yeah. you literally put like Steve. Have you given up on? I don't know, trying to increase leads from your website, whatever that problem pain yeah, point yeah, was that you it's, discussed. It's going, it's, and it's, that's it. That's literally yeah. the email. Have you given up on problem we discussed? And- well, it's, I, I suppose what I say is in a similar fashion, just slightly different. It's, it's, it's prompting the same reaction from them. It's to get them to say no in their head. That's all mm. you're doing. So I say, look, I get the, I, I get the, I'm going to close the file on this by saying that this voice, or no, no, don't do that. Yeah. Same thing. So you're just trying to get them to say no. It's all about going going for no. And there are books written. In fact, there's a book called Going for No. It's a very easy thing to say. 
but most people don't do it. And this is this is why I love salespeople. They love reading books. They just don't do anything in them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, I think we've wrapped it up quite nicely. Is there yeah. anything else that you want to finalize on, Benjamin? Have we covered pretty much everything? Uh, the, the simple rule is this. You're your own worst enemy in sales. And you need to figure out why you're doing what you're doing. Why do you feel a certain way when a prospect says or does something? Why do you let things keep happening to you? Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's not the prospect's fault. Prospects can't fail at being prospects. There's no way they can behave that is off the charts, that is beyond the pale. They're allowed to behave. And the fact that it should ever surprise or shock you means you lack any sense of ability to learn from your experiences. There is nothing a prospect can say or do that should ever shock you. It's predictable. You could write it on a piece of paper very rarely. So if anything's happening to you, it's your fault to so stop blaming the lead. Stop blaming the data. Stop blaming the recession or COVID or Brexit. Look in the mirror and say, why am I so shit at selling? And then figure it out and then change. There you go. Benjamin, always a pleasure. Never a oh, chore, sir. Thanks for coming thank back. You. I think you're the first person to be on four times, I believe it is Ooh, now. Three or four. four. Did you say four times? I think you've been on four times. Oh, no way. It's, it's three or four, so that, that's that's yeah, the first that's milestone it. for that, so congrats. That's and with that said, sir, please do tell us more about how everyone tuning in can learn from you, connect with you, and anything you want to promote. Uh, yeah, so easy to find me on LinkedIn. That's where I pretty much hang out most of the time. Um, my website, uh, UK's with an S, UK's most hated sales trainer.com. Um, and I'm running a couple of boot camps next month. They're currently just over half full. Got a questioning strategies boot camp, and we touched on a bit of that today. And I've also got a telephone prospecting boot camp. They're also on the website. Um, and if you've watched to the end, and if you decide you want to do one of my boot camps, if you enter the word Dunning, D U N N I N G, Dunning, it's the Sam Dunning discount. If you put that in at the um, checkout, I'll give you, I don't know, 150 quid off whichever boot camp you book on. But these are for the March ones. So Dunning, D-U-N-N-I-N-G, in the um, checkout where it says apply your code. But if you don't, tough. Got to pay the full rate. There you go. It's a deal. It's a steal. It's the bargain of the century. It is. Benjamin, thanks once again. We'll put all those, we'll put your link to your website over in the show notes at businessgrowth.marketing. And with that, I want to thank you once again, sir. Thank you for having me on. It's been a pleasure, Sam. No worries, sir. And as always, if you enjoyed the show, be sure to hit subscribe if you're on YouTube or give us a quick rating on the podcast channels. We interview business leaders each and every week and we share actionable marketing tips to grow your business, grow your revenue. And with that, we should catch you on the next one. Cheers. Goodbye.